welcome everybody. I'm I'm very happy uh, having Daniel Kogna. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, from KIT here joining us. If you don't know KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, it's both a it's it, it, it's it's one of the most beautiful things you can imagine. It's both a university and a Helmholtz center. So everything you you need in terms of administration is. <laughs> Legal team is overworked. Of course it is. <laughs> and it, it's one of the biggest Helmholtz centers, and, and as you can imagine, with a with a with a large university as Pace, uh, it's a it's a beautiful place for doing science. And Daniel is coming from Helmholtz AI. You would have guessed it from his uh, initial slide here. He's one of the um, AI consultants uh, at the KIT. Helmholtz AI unit, which is the energy unit. Yes. Unit. So, so as you know, Helmholtz has different research fields, matter, health, energy, and you're from the energy unit at, at KIT. And we both met at Scott's um, a while ago, or yeah, no, 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 that was actually like, HBC. It was, it was a very long HBC. It was an HBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, exactly. <laughs> and 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 one of the fascinating things, and this is why why I invited you today, uh, is to really think on the scalability of AI models by now, because I think this is really what fundamentally makes the difference between what we do on our laptops. In AI, where we have a simple GPU or maybe an eGPU besides our laptops, because we don't want to run out of battery. Um, but but uh, uh, and 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 the teams of Google and such, where they really have huge, large-scale infrastructure uh, to 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 use for AI and build build those gigantic, ginormous models. So I'm switching over to Daniel, of course, and just. <laughs> introducing so it should help that you actually see him um yeah and one of the wonderful things about kit is that they also have a have a great infrastructure for for ai which is icor uh which is which is one of the largest uh ai specific uh infrastructures in germany if not even in europe com uh, compared to size so this is a really wonderful place to study those scalable models and I'm very happy to have you here today. Thank you very much for joining us. He came. He just told me he came from Rome, so it's it's certainly not great to come here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy having you here. And floor is all yours. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. As mentioned, yes, my name is Daniel Coquelin. Coquelin. It's, it's, sorry. It, no, it, it's at this point I've heard it all different ways. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. As mentioned, I'm from Helmholtz AI, technically the energy subsection of that, which I uh, won't really be talking too much about, although I will allude to energy usages and savings during the talk. So let's jump in. That'll work. Perfect. Um, let's first talk about really, well, how good can neural networks be? We all know that deep, the neural networks are grabbing all the headlines as of late. And one of the largest leaps forward that they've made in science is actually AlphaFold 2, which was developed by Google to solve or to work on the structure prediction for proteins, which can be used for medical applications and really medical and pharma pharmaceutical and medical applications. The data set for AlphaFold for AlphaFold 2 was only 185,000 samples. I say only because there are many applications that have, frankly, much, much more. And even with these, with this number of samples, it still took more than 11 days training on 128 TPUs. This is normal for these large models and for these large data sets. I don't mean 11 days of time saying, okay, development and all of this summed up together. This was more than 11 days for the final model. So these things get expensive quickly. Let's take a, let's just review for a moment just what is artificial intelligence and what these methods really are. What what is really out there? Let's see if I can oh, yeah, sorry. move this guy exactly. off to the, into the corner here. Yep. That'll work. So artificial intelligence, they're programs that can sense and reason, adapt, and 
develop in time as they're trained and as we give them more data. This can be extremely powerful and a subsection of artificial intelligence is machine learning. And machine learning is then something that essentially improves as you give it more data. So in the classic case of this and what we mostly think of with machine learning is deep learning. And this is, as I mentioned, stealing all the headlines as in computing as of late. And for deep learning, most of what we want now is we want increased data sizes and we want more larger models because both of those things lead to better accuracy, but they also lead to, as I said, more training time. So what that means is we need parallel training methods and we need ways to reduce this time. But the question that everyone kind of comes back to in all of this is, um, how do I train my network? How do I, how do I get it working for my stuff? So before we go into the parallel things, let's just review how is a neural network trained? Essentially, what most of this does is versions of gradient descent and, and stochastic gradient descent. This is a classic here where we essentially just pass a random subset of our data through the network in the forward pass, and we calculate gradients in the backward pass and back with backpropagation, and then we apply an update rule. So in the classic SGD without any bells and whistles, this looks like this, where the gradients for this next, for the i step, are the gradients for the previous step minus essentially the average gradient across the, the random subset of the data that was passed through it times the learning rate. And so we want to step deeper into valleys as we go, as it looks here, and you can jump from one to the other. And gradient descent hope would theoretically make a shorter path, but SGD actually converges faster. This is great, low memory consumption, learning rate, easy, more or less easy here, but to really make this work well, we need to have improvements like momentum and weight decay. And then there are other things like Atom is the classic prototyping optimizer, which actually tracks the last, essentially it does an exponential moving average across the last uh, gradients for each parameter. All of these bells and whistles change how the network trains. This is all quite good and well until we get to scale. But let's kind of leave that for another day. This is something else to decide when somebody wants to work on a network. The first place to really start when working on neural networks is what do we, we need to look at the data first. We need to say, what do we want the method to learn? And then we need to answer, what is this intended to do after we're done training? And then, okay, okay, so we know we have answers to these questions. Now it's which method can do the job? We want to know, is it transformers? Is it convolutional layers? Is it a simple feed forward stack? What, how do I do that? And can I, can I take a similar method or a similar network out there and train on like that was trained on a similar data set, transfer that over and just fine tune this on my data set. And finally, as I mentioned before, that training method, then we can select the training method here. And after all this is done, then we need to think about, finally, oh, how do we make it go fast? And this is quite important because Python in and of itself is not the most efficient language. Python operates in what's known as an eager mode. And what this means is when it gets to a point, Python then executes a command. And this command, say it's in NumPy, it typically has a C backend that it will call the code and it will execute that function. It's, oh, my want my matrix multiplied by two. And then after that finishes, then it says, all right, I'm done, what's next? And so it goes all the way back up, gets it from Python, then says, all right, now do this. And it moves forward. This is inherently, well, it comes with some overhead. So Numba was the originators of jitting Python code. And then this is also this also exists in PyTorch. There are links in the PowerPoint here, which I'm sure we can share with the group after. Jitting is essentially bundling multiple commands together. This can really help because essentially you're compiling these things and you want to essentially group these calls and say, all right, do all these commands one after another and don't go back up to Python, just run all of these things. So this is a way to create serializable and optimizable models from PyTorch codes. So it's not just bundling the commands at runtime, you can actually save your model and then load it as a Torch script object 
use in in the C plus plus code or in some or in I think MXNet is in Apache. It's in Apache. Um, uh, Cap two, I think, it is is another one that you can load it in. There's in Java. Essentially, it's a serialized compiled object that you can use in another language that isn't reliant on Python. Furthermore, if we want to, if someone really wants to write something in C++, something that in C++ can be a lot faster for some operations, you can write in Python, in PyTorch's C++ front end, you can write Python extensions that are actually compiled C++ codes that will run through and run just like a, a function that you'll call from any other Python object, and it will call that, that C++ code and run through it. What I'd like to emphasize here, <laughs> Garbage in, garbage out is very much a thing in computer science, and it's unavoidable. If you're going to add one to every element of a matrix and you're just going to loop through it, it's probably not going to be the most efficient unless you're doing it in something like C++. And even then, it's probably better to let, it, to let someone else that works in this field really optimize these codes, because if it's written poorly, it won't fix it. It's not going to make it better magically. There's no magic bullet. Saying that, I will say there is something that we can do on GPUs, just on a single GPU or even on many. NVIDIA has developed what's called CUDA graphs. And essentially, what this comes down to is GPUs are faster than we can issue commands. So when we say, oh, well, I want to launch this command A, OK. We, we then send it to the GPU, it takes a little bit of latency, and then the GPU co co com computes A. And even if we know B, we want to launch B after this and we can send the next command, there's actually a little bit of dead space between those two and the communication from the CPU to the GPU. So CUDA graphs are essentially, they're very similar to jitting in that you compute this CUDA graph and you essentially make a serialized object that you essentially call later. And so when you create this graph and then you say, all right, I'm going to send all of these commands to, from, to the GPU at once, and then the GPU will run the whole graph. So you say, all right, launch graph, A, B, C, D, E, instead of going through A, B, C, D, E. This can be used very effectively and has been used very effectively in the ML Perf HPC competition, in benchmarking suite, not technically a competition. And this is used to capture networks forward, backward optimization paths, actually including these nickel communication calls. For those who don't know, nickel is very similar to MPI, and it's a method for GPUs to talk to other GPUs. Very similar. Let's, let's gloss over that one. So I mentioned that these models, we need more data and more time and, well, more energy. So as I say, when we, want, when, when, when we need more accuracy on these models, what happens is we need more data. GPT-3, even getting a little bit old now, I think they're coming up, OpenAI is coming out with GPT-4. GPT-3 was trained on 45 terabytes of data. This is not exactly environmentally friendly. <laughs> we can see that a flight from New York to San Francisco is roughly in this range here. These are estimates based on the compute time that these that are reported in the papers and the power, the, um, the uh, oh God, the data sheets for, I think these are mostly on V100s or TensorFlow V3 cards or V2 cards. And then comparing this with the CO2 emissions on average for, I think it was the US where they were run. But what it comes down to is, these take massive amounts of energy. So what this, what this means again is that we have to be careful about this. We have to know what we're doing. We need to optimize it before we just start running. Okay, we're gonna run on, we wanna run on a thousand GPUs for, or 128 GPUs. The code should be fast and optimized before that. We have to think before that happens. So let's jump in then. Let's think about, all right, we know how to run it locally. We know how to make it fast. Now, how do I run it in parallel? Well, there's a few different ways we can do that. We'll start with the data side here and then move into the model parallelizations. Just a quick list of these types of general types of parallelism for training neural networks. We have batch parallel, domain parallel, model unit parallel, pipelining or interlayer parallelism, 
we have intralayer parallelism and then hybrid hybridizations of these of these other types here and then auto parallelizations. I'll go into each of these in depth now. First, I want to talk about is batch parallelism. This is when we essentially take a random subsection of the data set and we take we make sure that we take full samples. So if we're working with pictures, we take the entire picture and say there's 10 pictures and we have four, um, let's make it five, so math is easier. And we have five ranks, essentially what we do is we say, okay, each one gets two of those images. And then we replicate the model on each of those, each of those ranks. So we do the forward backward step and then we have our gradients. And then essentially what we need to do is we need to synchronize this. We need to make sure that all these models are actually staying together somehow. We can do that with a parameter server in which all of these ranks will send them off to one other rank or, or a, another process running somewhere that essentially collects everything and spits out the next, uh, the next parameters to, to, for the next tests. This would obviously be asynchronous because they don't have to wait for the other workers to finish. However, this comes with a, a, a large asterisk because many of the, let's say that one rank finishes before another and then sends this data to the parameter server and now those parameters are updated. And then when the other rank finishes and it goes to send its data there, now those gradients are referencing old network parameters. So dealing with that is actually something that is something that has to be addressed and is mostly the reason why most large scale applications use an all reduce or a synchronous operation to keep all the models synced up and essentially this means that after the the after the forward backward step then all of the gradients are averaged and you move on together benefits of this is we have more memory on gpus now than we ever have i think the hopper will have i think it's 80 or maybe 120 gigabytes i Please don't hold me to that. I don't, I don't have the stat sheet yet. But even with 40 gigabytes, there are methods to train, I think it's 10 billion parameter or 2 billion parameter models. This is also widely studied. And as I mentioned, very, very widely used. And it's very easy to combine with other models because if you want to do something different with the model, that's fine. They won't, the, the deviation of the data doesn't change that. But for domain parallel, that's when things change because now instead of sharding across the, sam the sample dimension, now we're sharding on the domain dimension. So for images, this would be the equivalent of sharding your data set on, let's say it's images, one process would have red, one would have green, and one would have blue. Now all of a sudden your model needs to know what's happening because if it doesn't, how do you collect these gradients in the end? If, if you're not concerned with it, then fine, okay. but most of the time you want that information and you have to tailor your model more or less specifically for this. But the model distribution in this case is not technically specified. It just has to know somehow. There's also model unit parallelism in which a, the, this is the embarrassingly parallel version of model parallelism in which we essentially say, okay, for these filter dimensions of this convolution, they don't need to touch each other they, they um, are independent operations and we don't need to communicate. So they, they can be run on one and you can have extremely large convolution sizes and then be done with it. Then you can have transformer heads which are run on separate GPUs as well. Now we get into a little bit more complicated version of model parallelism which is pipelining or intralayer parallelism. This is when we divide the model on multiple GPUs. So you have layer one, layer one through A on GPU one, and then A through B on GPU two, et cetera, and so forth for the rest of the model. This can result in actually having communication bubbles because you essentially have to pass through worker one and then two and three and four, and then back when you go backward from four to three to two to one, and you have this area where they're just idling. There are methods around this, but then you have these stale gradients again. And now you have something else to kind of work with here and how does this play? This is another slightly more complicated version of this. And then we have the 
what is likely the most compl complicated version of model parallelism, which is intralayer or traditional model parallel. When someone says model parallel or layer <laughs> parallel, this is typically what they mean. And this is when the model operations are distributed across devices. For example, in any given layer, the operation that they're doing are split between multiple processes. So you would say, okay, let's say this is matrix multiplication. Only matrix, only um, process, GPU one and GPU two, they would have sections of a matrix. And then they would also have the corresponding data set or however you want to do this of the next matrix that is being multiplied with. So essentially you can either do it without communication or with communication, but that's where this gets a little bit. This could also be uh, vertical, the lines here. You're using yes, well, no, this is a little bit different. You wouldn't have these vertical because like this version here, like this matrix matrix multiplication uh -huh. is what's distributed between this. Okay, yeah. In pipelining, essentially, it's, it's divided here. Mm -hmm. And so this is great because it can really open up all of the memory of, of a supercomputer. If you say, okay, I want to work on 128 GPUs, you can do that. You can have massive, massive operations happening because you have the memory for it. But again, now everyone has to wait for all those operations to finish. So these operations, we can mix and match this. They're most of the time, Batch parallelism, you can mix it with anything. It, let's say you have model parallelism. You can do model parallel on four GPUs, and you can just essentially do batch parallel with another set of four GPUs. So this is independent of the model, and you only need to combine the gradients after your forward, backward step, however you get there. But you can have large batch effects, which are when the batch size gets very large, essentially your gradients, they can shrink, and they can be less specific. I always uh, analogize it to, it's instead of being in a car with three other people all saying that they know which way to go, instead you're in a bus with everyone saying different ways to go and eventually you just move a little bit instead of moving a larger amount and you can't tell which way is the right way to go. You also have synchronization times, which can be problematic here. Then there's the main parallel, which gives you tailored models, but it's tricky to develop. And you have specialized models again. Model unit parallel, this adds scalability without increasing communication. But there's been, as I mentioned, batch parallel has been studied a lot. And it can typically outperform model unit parallelism. It's just, this, this has gotten more attention. And though model unit can be more productive, or could be, right now batch parallel is just as per, is performant. Then we have this interlayer uh, parallelism or pipelining, and we can have these extremely deep models, but we're technically still limited by VRAM, although we can fit a lot there. And then we also have these communication bubbles. Oh, crap. <laughs> then we have inter intralayer uh, parallelization. The benefit mostly is that the model size is only limited by, your system, by the system memory and not the memory of any given GPU. But we have more hyperparameters to tune, and we need specialized network designs to actually make this work well. And then there are auto parallel methods, which can actually handle the distributions for the user. But many of these are specifically tuned for the systems that they are developed on. So it is not plug and play. It's not easy to just take it out of one environment and put it into yours. Just something to be aware of. So. I would like to talk about something I developed and not just the generalizations of the parallelization methods here. And this is batch parallelism on different levels, a method I call DASO, which stands for distributed asynchronous and selective optimization. The idea, the motivation behind it is to better utilize cluster architectures and reduce communications overhead. If we can, the idea would be to increase speed by selectively doing global updates. And I'll go into a little bit deeper in what I know or what I mean later with that. But so the global synchronization, instead of being this all reduce that I mentioned, where we go through all the processes and just average it, now we want the local synchronization, which is just node local, and then a global synchronization, and then a local update. The first step in the first one to think about is the local synchronization. This is this synchronous SGD, where we do the forward step, the backward step, we average everything, and then we have the same parameters on all of this, or, or the same gradients at the end of this average step. This is traditional torch distributed data parallel. 
And then after this, then we can then we need to think about the global synchronization. This is where things change a little bit. If we were to communicate from every one of these processes to every one of the other processes, this puts a heavier load on the network. So instead of doing that, what we can do is we can make use of the local synchronization first, which is much, much faster because these methods can just go through the CPU and they don't have to go through the, through the interconnect. So what this does instead is this says, okay, there's four GPUs on every node. I'm going to create an MPI group on this. Does it even have to go through the CPU then? Can Gary be? It, it depends if it needs to go G, GPU to GPU. Generally, it's easier to think that it goes through this anyway. There are uh, interconnects like NVLink, which can do GPU to GPU, but I think it's still controlled by the CPU. It's This is all a black box to me that I, that I try not to touch as much as possible. <laughs> I say this as someone who touches it quite frequently. <laughs> but the idea still is that instead of going over the interconnect, which connects the nodes and is just a little bit slower, even with InfiniBand, we just communicate from one GPU on all of them to all the rest. And so then we do the same average, and then we have this the average of these gradients or network parameters on the different nodes. Averaging the gradients in the network parameters is something to make note of because the network parameters can be averaged in a way that is stale. And we don't have to update them right away if we know the previous network parameters. If we're updating, if we're averaging stale gradients, the gradients are referencing something older. So this is where this can be a little bit more useful in my opinion. But after we do this, this uh, global synchronization within this hierarchical scheme, we still need to send from the GPU that's received it to all the other GPUs, and we can essentially... I did it again, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> you, you can, it, it's still obvious what happens. That's what the error was. This, this figure is larger. No, they, they, the other seat it's just you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries there. <laughs> so essentially what happens for the rest of these is they're actually overwritten by the updates that come from GPU A here. And then we have this broadcast and we... Uh, and then we can overwrite these values here. Before this happens, I'll mention that the, these values aren't just thrown away. They're actually averaged in, and then we take the results before, and we merge these together if the parameters are stale. So in practice, what this looks like is there are three main phases to this. There's the traditional blocking data parallel training in which we just forward, backward, synchronize. There is no hierarchical method to it. It's just do the full synchronization and move on. And then there's a cycling phase in which we do those three steps with the, um, the local synchronization, the global synchronization, and the local update. And then we have the cool down, which is a traditional blocking, neural, blocking data parallel network again, just as we know and love. But the cycling phase, this is what's a little bit more interesting here, in my opinion. So what happens is every after a certain number of batches, the global parameters are set. So every batch, we do this local synchronization. So we do a forward, backward step, and the local sync. And then every, every G batches, essentially, we say, all right, start sending this. And we can even have, on another MPI group, we can start sending here from this one. So we can saturate the network as best as possible without hitting the overhead from waiting for this to finish. And so after this is sent, then we continue doing these local trainings. So we continue and we wait for S batches to receive this data. And then when we receive this data, we can just do a simple weighted average and we can say, all right, this is four steps old. Okay, I'm gonna weight these local, these local parameters higher. I'm actually going to make these slightly more important Although typically there are many more elements in the global set. So it would be a sense of like giving this a weight of two against the weight of 16 or even like 30 or I think largest sets I did were 256. So it doesn't make a large difference, but it still is more important than this. And then we do that local update. So we have used all the values from the local operations and we didn't just throw them out. And then we continue on. And these S and G values here, when every G batches and every and the S batches that we wait, 
is actually cycle and factors of two. So once it happens that we see, okay, the loss is starting to plateau, it's not really getting any better here, then we'll drop it down and then, okay, still not improving or we hit the limit there then we'll drop it down again. And then if it's not, we still kind of hit this limit that we actually reset back to four and two or however we, however this is set up to be. And it cycles through this. How does this perform? Well, it does very well, actually. We keep up with Horovod, which is sort of the industry standard in a way, with, in terms of accuracy up to a certain point, in which point we start to see large batch effects, although we see it for both, um, for both Horovod and Dasso here. So over here, this is just on ResNet 50, trained on ImageNet. We can, we can see that, okay, this is almost exactly the same. And I mean, we edge them out there, but this could be a lucky seed. This, ha this happens with neural networks. But the main, the main takeaway here is on this left plot, where we can see that DASO for all of these measurements is about a factor of, is, a, is about 20% faster than Horobot. Bottom line in all this is these stale gradients and stale network parameters that can be used to train networks accurately. And these hierarchical, these hierarchical approaches, they accelerate neural network training. And about 20%, I mean, this is, Without accuracy loss, this is a this is a this is a big win. But naively changing these optimization patterns isn't enough to increase scaling. And what I mean by this is, when we hit this certain point here, we do still have these large batch effects. This is just with standard SGD things. This is with the same parameters on both networks. So this can be problematic. That it doesn't increase. So what comes next with this? Well, the ongoing work right now is actually using these CUDA graphs that I mentioned to combine this within DASO to actually make these, um, the cycling phase and the, the warm up and cool down. These were done in, I will admit, an inefficient method originally. So the idea now is to go back and clean this up and use what I've learned from the MLPerf HPC benchmarks and use that to increase the speed in those and hopefully go from a 20 to a 25%, which actually means that we can take down the time, take down that energy consumption by a fair margin. Also ongoing is applying DASO in these ML perf HPC benchmarks to see how, how far we can push it, how, how, what's the maximum scale for this. And then furthermore, I'll be testing the robustness of SGD in some of these methods like Adam and Lars and <laughs> many, many others. And furthermore, what I primarily work on is dreaming up alternative methods for these large scale optimizations with, da with using data characteristics. <coughs> My current idea is more or less not pre-filtering data, but essentially looking into the data. And instead of just doing this weighted average, I want to look at it and see, okay, this network on, on this node is learning about dogs. So why should we treat it the same as the network that's over here learning about cats? How can we combine that in a smarter way? That this is hopefully what I'm working on and hopefully something that I can implement into DASO in the future. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.